Hi, and welcome back to the Rhein-Ruhr stage in Monheim of the RC3. If you have any questions regarding the talk, um, please feel free to reach out on, on Hack and IRC in the channel rc3-r3s or on Twitter or Mastodon with the hashtag, um, hashtag uh, rc3r3s or our Mastodon handle r3, at r3s at chaos.social. Um, off, top, off topic again, um, we have put a link to the um, CO2 indicator you saw here and asked on our website, um, so you can find it there, r3s.nrw slash news slash CO2 dash ampel with an alpha A. Um, up next, we're uh, still uh, talking about artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and ethics. Um, when asked, the speaker didn't provide his credit card number, so I sadly can't share it he here with you. But he told me, uh, but he told me he likes ramen. Um, he already was on the Congress, but this is his first time speaking. Uh, he worked in India, Bangalore, and now Singapore. Um, he described himself as a code monkey. So please feel free to give a very warm virtual welcome to Eiko Klostermann and his talk, Artificial Intelligence, More Like Artificial Stupidity. Please have fun. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, right, to the point, artificial intelligence or um, more like artificial stupidity. Um, it's not just a, not just a clickbaity title. There's, there's actually something behind it. Um, and what I, what I want to do today is I want to tell you a couple of stories. I want to tell you a couple of stories about ML, like machine learning, and um, uh, stories about data, stories about artificial intelligence. Um, and some of these are success stories. Um, everything went well, um, great use case, great outcome. But some of them are not. Some of them failed, um, and some of them pretty hard. And, and especially in, into those, I would like to dig a little bit deeper and uh, talk a little bit about why they failed and, and what we can do um, in the future to, to prevent that. And when I say I'll be telling you a couple of stories, um, I'm, um, let me start with one of the, at least in my opinion, one of the greatest storytellers um, that, we, that we had, that's uh, Douglas Adams. And I'm sure a lot of you have read this book, or at least know about this book, or these, these books. Um, well, there are actually five, three good ones and then two others. Um, but uh, even if you haven't read them, you, you must have come across the, the memes that they brought us, that uh, 42 is the answer to uh, the life, the universe, and everything, and that we should not panic. But Douglas Adams um, has also introduced another thing in his um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books, which is um, this Babel fish, or the idea of this Babel fish. And, and for you, uh, if you don't know it, let me quickly uh, explain a little bit what this Babel fish is. It's, it's a tiny yellow fish um, that's living somewhere in the universe, right? And you can put that into your ear. And when you put this fish into your ear, the fish picks up the, the brain waves of the um, organisms around you. And whenever they say something in their own language that, that you don't understand, this fish picks that up and translates it and basically um, excretes it into your ear as a language um, that you are familiar with. So it, it translates every spoken language uh, of the universe around you into a language that you understand in your ear in real time, which is, I mean, it's pretty crazy, right? That is obviously it's a, it's a fictional idea. Douglas Adams says a couple of crazy um, ideas, uh, this is clearly, um, is, is not really working, right? There's no, there, I, I, there's no um, knowledge of the existence of such fish and it would be really surprising if it were real. So it's, um, it's um, pretty, um, it's a fictional idea. It would never be true really. Uh, but let me show something 
Let me show you something, something else now. Hello and herzlich willkommen. It's, it's actually not working that well um, with the with the spinning. So that's the live demo, right? Um, never really works that good. Uh, let me quickly walk you through what I would have done if it would have worked. Uh, I would have said something in German and in real time, and I probably don't need to demo this because you've all used Google Translate before. It would then um, translate this into English in real time, and you could, uh, uh, maybe let's try that. Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu meinem Vortrag über künstliche Intelligenz. All right, so it worked. It, it uh, translates it in real time immediately into a language, into a different language. And I, I could pick different ones, whatever you understand, if you, if you don't under speak, uh, uh, understand German. And that is, I mean, it's not quite this Babel fish, but it does this instant translation from one language into some other language. And we, um, we have a, uh, uh, something else that I'll show you, that, that Google is not only uh, providing this, this Google Translate, and there are other um, non-Google uh, translation services as well. But Google in particular is also selling these Pixel Buds, which is, which is in-ear wireless uh, headphones that you can plug into your ear that do support this, this translation feature. Um, you still need to have a smartphone, but basically what it's doing is you, you plug those, those Pixel Buds into your ear and someone is saying something in language you do not understand and the phone and then forwarding it to the to the earbuds are live translating that into a language that you do understand so this absolutely crazy idea that darkness Adams had of this babel fish that that uh, is more or less implemented nowadays and it could have not been imagined like just a decade ago but it's implemented more or less through and it's mostly machine learning that is powering this translation um, there's machine learning multiple levels of picking up what I say, um, the, the speech to text, and then translating it. And that is just fascinating, right? That is, a, and as someone living in a country where I didn't grow up in speaking a, a language that is not native to me, this has been so useful for me. And I'm sure it has been useful for so many other people. This is, a, this is an exceptionally useful tool that, that machine learning has made, made possible for us. Well, that is one of the positive examples that I'm, that I'm talking about. But there's an even, even more impros Im impressive uh, example that I, that I like that, that machine learning has um, enabled us. And it is about detection of cancer cells based on image data. And uh, a couple of, for a couple of years now, um, there are machine learning models that look at, this, at, at image data of cells, of human cells, and they can identify whether there are cancer cells shown or not with a higher accuracy than, than doctors, than trained professionals whose job is it to do exactly that, looking at these images and figuring out are there cancer cells or not. And there are machine learning models that are better than that uh, for uh, breast cancer. And I think last year, Google released a model that, that can detect uh, cancer cells better in, in image data for lung cancer as well. And this is clearly, this is a life-changing functionality that we are given by the advances, by the recent advances of, of machine learning. But coming, to the, uh, coming back to the title of the talk, Artificial Stupidity, they are clearly, uh, and you've all seen some of them. I'll just give a couple of examples here seen examples where AI fails, where machine learning fails. And you can see here on the, on the very right, there's a, there's a, a Twitter user, and um, that Twitter user is tweeting to Indigo, which is an Indian airline, and he's, he's uh, having this sarcastic tone saying, hey, thank you for sending my, my baggage to Hyderabad while flying me to Kolkata. And I assume there's an AI answering this, some kind of chatbot. So, hey, uh, we are glad to hear that where clearly the, the AI simply didn't pick up on the sarcastic tone of that message. And in the, in the middle, there's an example where someone is messaging PayPal and saying, hey, I got scammed, which is a serious thing, right? Uh, and PayPal is, and I assume again, it's a chatbot reaction says, hey, that's great. And on the left, there's, a, there's another example um, where, where this went wrong. But this is um, now coming to my favorite 
uh, one of my favorite examples where um, something went wrong in, in, in that case. And this is, if you, if you know Mandarin, you could maybe figure out what, what is, what's going on here. If not, I'll just like, um, tell you, give you a little bit of a background what's going on here. In China, there are a couple of cities that have implemented uh, cameras um, across, or, or on, on uh, traffic lights um, crossing for pedestrian crossing. You can see the zebra crossing there. And, and what these cameras do, they basically film the zebra crossing. And whenever there's a red light for pedestrians, but the pedestrian is crossing, they film that. They figure out they have, um, they figure out that there's a person crossing. They have um, um, object recognition. They figure out that there's a person walking. And then, and this is what you can see here. They have a gigantic screen next to it where they show that person and you, they zoom in and, hey, this person uh, just crossed at the red light. Uh, so basically shaming that person. Um, and they also, it goes even further. Um, they also, uh, not only do they have object recognition and identify there as a person, they also have face recognition and identify who that person is. And not only do they know who that person is, they also know the mobile number. So, and it happened in this case, they've, they've sent this person a message, hey, we just saw you jaywalking. We just saw you crossing the, the street while there was a red light. And if you look at this picture now, you can see, oh, wait a second. There's not really a person crossing the street. It's a bus that is driving by, which of course the bus has a green light. It's a bus driving by with the face of a person printed on the side of it. In fact, this is, this, in this case, it's this, the CEO of this company, the advertising, um, having advertisement of, um, on that bus with her. And, and she was actually in a different city and she got this notification, hey, you, you just crossed the red light, and she was like, oh, "That's not true." Um, and there's, um, and that's uh, clearly there is something that is an example where AI failed, and it, it goes even further. Um, not in this case, but in, in other cities, this system is not only not only identifies the person and and who that person is and messages that person, but also because they know who that person is, and due to regulations, that means that the, that the government knows also your bank account. And they know their bank account. They also know your WeChat Pay account. And in a couple of cities, when you get caught by this, by this machine learning system, by this image recognition system, crossing the red, red light, you get deducted the fine for this crime within seconds from your WeChat Pay account. So um, in this case, it didn't happen. But imagine you're crossing the street, it's red light. They, everything is automated. They deduct the fine immediately. And that is something, um, and that's why I say um, it's, a, it's a great example where it can fail because it is an impactful fail. A Twitter bot doing a stupid answer is laughable most of the time, right? But in this case, it actually does have a um, significant negative, negative impact. Um, and let me talk a little bit. I've, I've mentioned machine learning and artificial intelligence um, a, a couple of times. Let me quickly um, give a little bit of context um, Surely most of you have, have heard these terms and they have been hyped for the last couple of years. Um, at least for this particular talk, um, I, would, I would propose the following definitions that I've found. Uh, and for artificial intelligence, that is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Now, and, and the important thing to note here is that this definition, and this is a definition that, you, that is from the Oxford Dictionaries. Um, and if you, if you use Google and you type define artificial intelligence, this is the one that is being used as well. I, I have friends who disagree with this definition, but let's just keep it for, for this talk at least. And the important thing to note here is that the definition does not talk about a particular technical approach. It is saying it is a computer system that does something and you would usually assume is human intelligence is necessary for doing that. I'll give you an example a chess program. If you play chess against someone, you would assume that person is somewhat intelligent. Uh, you assume some kind of, of uh, human intelligence at least. Now, if you, if you write a chess program for that, um, how would you actually end up implementing that? You can, in the simplest form, 
look at the state of the chessboard, look at the pieces, and just brute force all the different moves and subsequent moves that are possible. And then pick the set of moves that in the end give the result that you want, which is winning the game. And now brute forcing, having a couple of loops and some if-else, is not particularly sophisticated coding, right? Um, however, it, it would match this, this um, magical definition of artificial intelligence that I think is used quite often, especially nowadays, where it's such a marketing term, really. Um, and then there is machine learning, which is where I think it's actually a little bit cooler, which is, which is where the, the cool things are happening. Because for machine learning, the software engineers, the coders are not really defining the algorithm anymore. The machine learning system is trained with the data and it tries to emulate, tries to generalize that, and then tries to match um, the trained behavior with new data. And, and that is something where the, the algorithm gets defined basically by the data and the, the uh, machine learning algorithm um, and architecture, but um, it is not defined by the uh, engineer anymore. And then there are neural networks, which is basically machine learning that emulates like the, the biological brain, of, like um, neurons and, and connections between all of those neurons or some of those neurons. And then there's deep learning, which is also pretty hype term for the last couple of years, which is basically uh, artificial neural networks, but um, a lot of these layers. Uh, uh, and that is um, basically what, what uh, it ends up being. And I uh, give you a, a, a quick example. And this also, um, so it's called deep neural network uh, on this slide. It's actually a very, uh, it's actually relatively shallow with only um, three hidden layers and what is this, like 10 uh, input variables. The real production um, uh, deep neural networks can have uh, 50 or even hundreds of layers, 100 layers or even more than that and thousands of input variables. And the, the thing to note here is that even with this very simple example, you can see like all these nodes are connected, right? They're like, basically there's some information flowing from one node to the other, from one neuron to the other. But if you look at this, it is, it's virtually impossible for a human to understand what is really going on here. Like if, if there were now data flowing from all of these to, to all the others, and it is, even with a small example, it's just, I can't comprehend what is really going on here. And that is one of the, that is one of the, the key problems that I see with the deployment of the machine learning models that we have nowadays. It's basically a black box model. You, you don't define the algorithm anymore. And even if you look at it, you don't, you don't understand what's going on. Um, that makes it very difficult to debug. It makes it difficult to predict how it will actually, how the model will react if I give it data that it hasn't seen before. And that is, that is one of the two um, issues that I, that I see, that the machine learning models that we use and deploy in production and use for um, impactful tasks are basically unpredictable. Uh, they are black box behavior. Right, that is the one thing. And um, I would like to go to the other thing. There's, there's two things, um, two issues that I see. That was the first. Um, let me tell you an example um, that, that showcases the second uh, issue a little bit better. Um, and again, I'm telling you a story. And in this case, it's the story of the city of Boston, uh, 2011. And the city of Boston, in 2011, they had a problem. And their problem was that they had a lot of potholes in the city. And as I mentioned, it's 2011. They did what everyone did in 2011. They built an app. Uh, so they had an app for that. And the app, I, I must admit, it's a pretty smart idea. The app worked in the way that... Um, you would, you would install this app on your phone and then the, you, would, you would drive around and when you get in your car, you put the phone on the passenger seat with the app running. And so you would drive around the city and whenever you would hit uh, a pothole, there would be a bump. The phone would pick up uh, through the accelerometer, would pick up, ah, oh, there was some movement. Um, there, must, there must be a pothole and would then take the GPS coordinates of that particular location, send it to the servers of the city of Boston so that they then could come later uh, and, and fix up the portal. So they did that, they deployed that, uh, people installed the app um, and they let it run for some time. And what they noticed was that the, the data provided ended up being um, showing only potholes in the high cost of living areas of the city. And if you're like only the, only the regions where rich people live, right? And if you think about that, that doesn't really make sense. Why, why would there only be potholes in, in these areas? Um, 
you would at least somewhat expect an evenly distributed um, amount of potholes across the city. Um, if anything, probably less in those rich people areas. But what the data showed was that it's um, more or less only there. Um, and, and, and the reason for that, as they then found out, was that so in 2011, the world was a little bit different um, than nowadays. Um, smartphones were still relatively new, and particularly ones where you could install apps on. So, I mean, nowadays, every five-year-old is watching TikTok videos on their, uh, on their smartphone. But 2011 was, was a different time. And that led to only relatively wealthy people having smartphones with these uh, and where, where they could install this app. Um, and now the, the, the thing to note here is there's no machine learning involved. It's, it solely is that the, the data provided was wrong. There's no machine learning. It's simply that the data just it was not representative of the reality. Um, so to, in um, coming back to this example, the they fixed that issue, and I, I think it's equally smart how they actually address this. Um, they then put the app on phones and put those phones into public buses and garbage trucks. So they would then um, cover the whole city and they had a, a significantly better data set that they could work with and then go in and fix those portals. But again, the, the, the important thing here is there was no machine learning involved. It was simply the data that was, that was screwed because it, was, like, it had a social bias to it. Let me show you another example here. Um, and okay, at least I'm trying that. Let's see how the uh, demo gods are with me now. Um, you might you might have uh, you might remember this. Um, it was it, it became popular a couple of years ago. Um, I'm, I'm writing two sentences here. Um, uh, one is she is a doctor. And he is a nurse, and I'll let Google Translate translate it into Malay. And the interesting thing about Malay is that it does not have gender-specific pronouns. Well, in English, you have he and she, and they indicate male or female. Um, you can see here that I actually don't speak Malay. Uh, I guess the first word is the pronoun. Um, but what you can see is that there is no differentiation she gets translated to the same word that he gets translated to. So, and the, the interesting thing that we see here, and, and remember I typed she is a doctor and he is a nurse. If this gets translated into Malay, where it loses this gender information, and if I now click this button, it takes the translated Malay version and translates it back into English. And let's see what happens here. Remember she nurse, uh, she doctor, he nurse. And all of a sudden, the translated English is he is a doctor and she is a nurse. So the translation lost the, the gender information, uh, but then had to bring back some gender information and pick the exact opposite of what I initially typed in. And I know I had, I had Google Translate as a very valuable, great example of, of use of machine learning. But what we can see here is, and this again, the, the machine learning part works well in a way. What is, what is the issue here is the data. Because the reason why this machine learning model translates this Malay sentence without gender into this gendered sentence and is using he for doctor is because the way these models are trained is basically reading a lot of text in like the same text in different languages, uh, reading this in English and reading this in Malay, and then figuring out over time lots of different texts, text over text, and figuring out how to translate one to the other. And these texts, historically speaking, these texts, when they were talking about doctors, they were talking about him, they were talking about he, they were talking about a male doctor, because historically speaking, that was probably the case. Nowadays, we know that it's that there has no reason for any gender not to be a doctor. Uh, the same thing applies for the nurse, right? Um, anyone can be a nurse. But then historically speaking, the texts that were used to train this model uh, were usually talking about a female being a nurse. And this, was, um, this became popular a couple of years ago in, in the Turkish language. 
And Google then did something. Google had to manually intervene uh, because people complained about it, uh, rightfully so. Uh, and then they added this extra feature. Hey, uh, look, in Turkish, uh, it actually can mean both things, uh, he and she. Um, but there's a manual thing that they had to set up particularly for Turkish. And again, the, the thing here is the machine learning model, the, the black box behavior, uh, it's not the issue. The data is what, what was the issue here. And I'm also sure that a lot of you remember Tay. That was Microsoft trying to train some kind of language model uh, on Twitter and I think some other platforms. And basically what they wanted to do, they had a, a model that was able to communicate, like send text and, and form sentences in a way. And they wanted it, uh, this, they wanted this model to, to learn from humans how they interact, how they speak. Okay, now if the premise is you want to teach this, this machine learning, how humans interact, is Twitter a good place to teach that? Uh, don't know, maybe the premise is a little bit questionable. Um, the outcome, however, is, is not very questionable. They had to shut it down in less than 24 hours. Um, there were um, a lot of people figured out what was going on. They were training that, that bot um, and they were using, um, they basically uh, made it a, a, a racist, by a horrible piece of um, uh, bot. Uh, and, and there are, yeah. Uh, it was basically abused, but the, the, the thing is um, that, and this is, um, so the last one uh, that I'm, the last example that I'm giving here uh, kind of showcases that there's someone saying, hey, you are just a stupid machine. Uh, and, and correctly so, Tay tweets, hey, I, I learned from, from you and you are dumb too. And, and that is, um, I think again, the, the lesson here is that the data that was given to this, to this machine learning model then turned it into a, uh, this, um, this racist bot. Um, right. And there's, there's another example that I, that again, Tay was just a Twitter bot, um, it was an experiment from Microsoft. I hope they learned something. Um, but there are systems nowadays that we use where machine learning is used, where data that trained these models were used that have a significant higher impact. And the Compass system is one of them that's used in the US. Um, it's basically used um, um, if people commit a crime in the US, they, they fill out this questionnaire, like 200 questions or so. And this data that again gets used to predict whether the person will re-offend or not. Basically, um, the person gets a jail sentence and if they come out, will they, do, will they commit a crime again? Right? And this, this system says it's likely or not likely based on the, this questionnaire. And this was analyzed. This was analyzed by, by ProPublica and the outcome is quite interesting. Um, so there are basically two ways how you can be wrong, right? So ProPublica looked at, at um, the, these offenders and then um, after they got released and the next two years um, to figure out whether they uh, committed a crime, recommitted or not. And you can be wrong in two ways. The system can be wrong in two ways, um, basically false positive, false negative. So you predict the person will re-offend, but the person does not. Or the other way around, you predict or the system does predict the person will not re-offend, but then the, the, the person actually does re-offend. And there was a there was a, a relative um, interesting bias that that um, ProPublica noticed here for the white population of these uh, of this test of this analysis. Um, only twenty three percent were labeled a high risk that they probably re-offend, but then they did not. For the African American part of this test um, of this analysis, almost forty five percent were labeled a high risk. And then it turned out they, they didn't actually reoffend. And the opposite is true for, for the, the other case. Being labeled a lower risk, it was almost 50% of the white uh, test subjects were labeled a lower risk and then actually did reoffend. And for the African Americans, only 28% were labeled a lower risk um, and then did reoffend. So there clearly is a, a racial bias in this data uh, yeah, that the system is then using. And the interesting thing is that none of the questions were using, were asking questions about um, a skin color or, or um, ethnical uh, background. So this was um, gathered from, from other data. Somehow this, this system would get trained to um, predict uh, a higher risk for African-Americans than for white people. And that is, that is a very impactful thing. This data gets used to, to determine bail sentence by judges. This data even get used to 
uh, determine prison, the length of prison sentences by, by, by judges. Um, and this system is still being in use nowadays. And I have one more example, um, and a quite impactful uh, one as well. You know, autonomous driving cars, right? They will take over our streets. Maybe not in two years, maybe not in five years, maybe not in 10, but in 20, 30 years, there will be uh, probably a high amount of autonomous driving cars on our streets. And these streets, these, these cars basically work in a similar way. They have lots of sensors. Um, a, a lot of them, a lot of the sensors are cameras. They are systems that are only cameras, for example. Um, and then they try to figure out, okay, uh, where can I drive? And one thing that they, as a driver, you probably know that you don't want to hit a pedestrian, or even as a non-driver, you can imagine you wouldn't want to do that because that's bad. Um, and the and so these systems try to figure out who is a pedestrian and who is not. Um, do I need to break? Do I need to um, circumvent that that person or whatever that is um, or not? Right. And an interesting uh, study found out that is uh, that these autonomous driving um, vehicles or the systems that that power them are, are have a higher or uh, fail basically to to detect dark-skinned pedestrians more than white-skinned or, or a light-skinned pedestrian. And that means um, that if you, and accidents happen, right, there will be, if you have, you have millions of cars, billions of cars on the streets, accidents do happen. There will be situations where there are a lot of, a lot of situations where uh, these cars have to make decisions, do I brake or do I drive? And if these systems are more likely to fail to identify a pedestrian based on their skin color, then these systems will eventually end up killing people because they are dark-skinned, more likely than, than killing non-dark-skinned um, pedestrians. And that is a, can't get more impactful than that. Uh, and that's just a horrible outcome. Uh, um, um, it's an amount of power we give to these systems that uh, we cle clearly should not. I think everyone can, can agree. Right, so I remember my mom telling me, um, Hey, if you would jump, if your friends would jump from a bridge, would you do the same? Uh, clearly, I would not, right? Uh, but that's exactly how machine learning models work. And if the data we feed in is, is biased and is broken, then that's how they act. Right, and now you're telling me, I go, so there's machine learning everywhere, and you're telling me it has these horrible consequences, the world is on fire. Um, is there anything we can do? And the answer is yes. Uh, and the, the, the industry is already moving in the right direction. Uh, and and the one one of the things that we need to to um, uh, counter this black box behavior of machine learning models is we need explainability of these models as a selection criterion. If if there are multiple models, and one is actually built in a way that it that it makes it understandable, explainable to the developer, hey, this is why I react in a certain way. This needs to be a focus. Um, and there's there have been examples, especially in image recognition. You can see here on on the very bottom. Um, it's a, it's a um, methodology called deconvolutionizing or deconvolution, um, where you can see this, these layers of the machine learning model, and you can basically see what they detect. So the first one is just seeing pixels, and then the other one is seeing shapes, and later more complex shapes and, and facial features and things. So you, you kind of know what, what they are detecting. In general, we need to move away from this standard machine learning approach where we just put data into a model, and then we take the predictions into a, um, like a, like a um, human interpretable um, model where we put data into a model and then have some way of interpreting this, um, have human inspection, improve the data and the model and run it again and come to a point where we actually have a model that, that works as we, as we want it. Right, um, and one, one methodology or one technology that I would highly recommend also using is called Lime. And it, it's fantastically simple and it's so powerful how it works. Uh, it basically, I'll give you an example here. There's a, you can see uh, there's a picture of a frog and, and it gets identified as a, as a predicted as a, as a tree frog. And what Lime does, it basically takes away parts of this, of this image and then lets the model predict the same thing again with a reduced amount of data. And you can see that here in the middle on, on the top. And the outcome is, I mean, it's relatively simple. If the prediction is still the same outcome, then you know the data you have removed was not relevant for that prediction, right? And you can see that in the middle, there are some, there are some data got removed and the prediction is way off. Uh, it's like, the, it's not a tree frog anymore. 
And so by, by removing certain parts of the data and then seeing if it still predicts the same thing, you can figure out which part of the input data was actually relevant for the outcome. And that's how you can figure out um, why you're, what is relevant for your model and, and why the model decided in a certain way. And as if we don't need another argument for more diverse teams, I think having better predictions, having better machine learning model, uh, having better data is another good reason for, for diverse teams. Uh, we think of the autonomous driving cars. If the team would have had dark-skinned people, um, they probably would have thought of that and would have tested them. Uh, and there's, um, I mean, there's a wide range of arguments and that is an issue in our industry to have more diverse teams. I think this is just one more on, on top of the list of long arguments for that. Another thing that I would recommend if you're working with these systems is looking at the data ethics canvas, which is something that's released um, um, by the um, uh, ethics, uh, which is uh, basically uh, a, a set of questions that you want to go through um, before you start a data centric project where you can figure out, okay, this is uh, this, uh, this is my limitations of my data sources, who am I sharing with? A set of questions that you want to look at, think about um, before you make, um, start working with that. And then there's one more thing um, that is really helpful figuring out to figure out uh, how biased your data is, which is uh, Google Facets, where it's a visualization you just throw in your data and it visualizes, it shows you what's going on. And, and it's super simple. Like you throw your data in here, you can see, oh, look, I only have 20% um, female uh, people in my data set. Clearly, um, they're underrepresented, and then I need to adjust my data set. That being said, um, thank you so much. Um, thanks for all the fish. Uh, I hope I could give you some, um, some insights on the two big problems that I see with machine learning or AI models that we have nowadays and what, I, um, what we can do to actually fix those, fix those two issues. So yeah, um, thanks for giving us uh, such an introspection in our uh, future overlords. Um, before we get to the questions, um, just to prevent um, worried messages in the chat, um, the bandage around my wrist is not because of an emergency. Um, it's just that I'm uh, left-handed and left-handed people tend to have problems with um, wrist strain in their uh, left hand. So um, our microsearch uh, was so nice and um, stabilized my wrist, just so you don't need to worry. Anyways, um, to our questions. Um, um, yeah, the first one was um, traditional statistical met methods also provide an uncertainty. Would it be possible for artificial neural networks to notice the input is outside the training set or even compute an uncertainty? Um, excellent question. I cannot answer that question. Um, I will research that. Um, maybe if you, whoever asked the question, uh, maybe you can ping me somehow. You can find me. If you just Google my name, you'll find a way to contact me. Uh, I would like to have a conversation about that. Okay. Um, doesn't the gender is uh, sorry? Doesn't the gender assumption reduce wrong tr translation statistically, uh, since biases are still present to some degree? Oh, I mean, it it obviously, I mean, you, the okay. The statement is is correct in the way that it does. You have to pick some gender, and and picking a historically uh, more prevalent might be a good idea, but then. Looking forward, if we like uh, looking forward, I don't, I wouldn't see why. Um, and let's talk about um, nurses and doctors, or we can talk about all the other things. Like if we talk about IT industry, there's a there's a big male focus for for a reason that doesn't really make sense. Right? Um, so there is, I think the, the the problem that we would run into is that we um, continue pushing this bias that uh, doesn't really have a reason. Um, I mean, we would trade off that historically speaking, we probably would be correct. But in the future, I, I mean, even though it is still the case, I don't see why in the future we wouldn't have like an evenly distributed um, uh, gender spectrum across uh, doctors, nurses, or IT professionals for that matter. 
So I, I think the, the risk here is that we, that we continue pushing this bias uh, onto, onto people that, that would probably, it's like a, this feedback loop that then causes the, the bias to come back again. And I, I think that's the, that's the problem. I mean, you would probably add some kind of more accuracy, at least for now, but you would ruin future generations. So I'm not sure if that's worth it. Um, the next question um, is, will links to sources be uploaded somewhere? Um, I have not planned that, but I can do that. Um, again, maybe just contact me. I can send them to you. Okay. Um, how was the open source experience so far? Um, in, I would assume in particular for this topic, I guess. Um, I guess the whether it's open source or not is is not really relevant for the for the bias. I mean, potentially people are more aware um, of these biases, but the um, I mean the, the tools uh, itself are probably less impacted by that, or the tools that we are using. Um, are, I mean, the majority of the, at least for, for deep learning, uh, the technologies, most of them are, are, are open source as far as I know. Um, so I, I guess the open source or closed source um, discussion is not, um, or, or conversation doesn't have that much impact on, on the bias or on the black box behavior. Um, and the last question um, is, what was the last data analysis tool shown? Uh, Google Facet, um, like F-A-C-E-T-S, and the big G in the beginning. Uh, it's just, it's really relatively nice. Throw in your data and it, it um, visualizes it. It's quite, quite nice. Okay, um, maybe we can uh, provide links to that um, on our um, on our on our channels like Twitter and Mastodon, so um, our viewers can um, pick it up there and uh, have a look at it. So yeah, um, also the Signal Angel passed to me that passed over to me that um, there were there were lots of thanks for the talk and. Um, I can only join them. So thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for ca for virtually coming over half half the world uh, to be here in Monheim. And yeah, ha have a lot lot of fun uh, on the rest of the RC3. And we hope to hear from you again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs>